Good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where this video finds you. I was recently down at a thrift store looking for used books, as I usually am, and I came across this baby right here. The Basic Writings of Sigmund Freud. Now this is a find, okay? Now, uh, this book has five books in it, it's a compilation, and the books that it has are The Psychopathology of Everyday Life, The Interpretation of Dreams, th Three Contributions to the Theory of Sex, Wit and Its Relation to the Unconscious, Totem and Taboo, and The History of the Psychoanalytic Movement, which is not five, that's actually six, um, so I can't count. But anyways, uh, I was very happy to find this. Uh, and I think I'll do each book sort of as its own video. I was thinking about waiting till the end of the book and just doing all of the, uh, or at the end of the compilation, and doing all six books as one video. Um, but then the video would be like an hour long, and I don't want to torture all my viewers in Edmonton to force them to watch an hour long video. So I think I'll just do a series, right? Like as I each finish each book uh, within the compilation, I'll do a separate video, maybe throw them into a playlist or something like that. So anyways, going on to Freud. Everybody likes to criticize him and crap on him, but no one's actually read him, okay? <laughs> uh, so, anyways, uh, one interesting thing to note is that um, this series of papers and essays was published before computers, so a lot of the arguments that Freud makes in the book are not really backed up by uh, rigorous statistical methods like we would expect from a scientific paper today. And so instead, Freud uses a lot of intuition, logical arguments, and mostly examples from his experience, or examples that have been relayed to him through other scientific uh, authorities. And I actually find this really refreshing and very preferable to scientific uh, than to statistical methods. Um, st if you've ever read a scientific paper um, from the last 20 years, uh, it it's difficult to like make a jump from their arguments when they're using just stats. I mean, of course, stats is like logically rigorous. I understand that. I'm in school for it, but I don't know. I really like Freud's appeal to like intuition and examples. It feels like more natural. Um, anyways, uh, going on to the first book, which is what I'm reviewing, not reviewing, or providing a synopsis of today, is The Psychopathology of Everyday Life. So, it, before we start, it's important to understand like where Freud's coming from in regards to like how he views the mind. So, um, the way that Freud conceptualized the unconscious is that there are a few forces at play, you've probably heard of them before. You have the id, the ego, and the superego, right? So the id is the part of the brain that's sort of, uh, or the personality, I should say, that is concerned with the gratification of needs, right? So needs for love, hunger, survival, sexual impulses, social validation, things like that, right? Um, and then the ego is a modified portion of the id that arises in childhood after repeated exposures to the expectations of society. So, in other words, like socialization. So, uh, and, and the, the role of the ego is to regulate the desires of the id so that they are expressed appropriately within the context of society. So, right, for, for example, like, if I'm at the food court and I'm hungry and I see somebody eating fries, my id might tell me to, like, go over and just take, start eating them. Right, but of course that's inappropriate. So my ego tells me like, no, don't do that. Instead, like go to the stand, buy some with your own money for yourself, etc. Right, uh, and then we have on top of that the super ego, which is again a modified portion of the ego and constitutes one's sense of ethical conviction or uh, conscience. Uh, and ultimately, the, for the first book, Psychopathology of Everyday Life, the first two, the id and the ego, are like more important. Um, and of course, these first two things, the id and ego live within the subconscious and if they're always sort of like duking it out at all times and we're often unaware of their workings and um, sort of yeah un unaware of this this battle that's going on so uh, one thing that we often take for granted nowadays is this idea of the unconscious and this is probably Freud's biggest contribution right um, so before Freud this concept at least for formally didn't really exist, and, or it, if it did, at least played a very minor role in conceptualizing the human consciousness. And so, um, even though modern people kind of take this idea for granted, like everyone's sort of acquainted with the idea of the unconscious, we kind of really owe it to Freud. He's the one that kind of popularized and um, expounded upon this idea. So, uh, 
a second here. So, like I said, the id and the ego sit in the unconscious, um, and the unconscious is not just like a small part of our brain that like has an effect every once in a while. Freud kind of sees the unconscious and the conscious mind like an iceberg, right? Where the conscious mind is the 10% that sits above the surface, and the unconscious mind is like the 90% that sits below the surface. And Freud's kind of big claim or discovery just beyond um, the existence of the, of the unconscious is the idea that uh, our unconscious thoughts, behaviors, and emotions that arise from the unconscious are not totally random. Instead, they, uh, they have reasons and perceptible patterns to them. And these patterns might be strange or nonlinear, but there's logic behind them. And uh, through the psychoanalytic method, we can trace back these unconscious associations or trains of thought and reveal the source material, uh, which ends up in most cases being a repressed memory or a repressed fantasy or impulse. <clears throat> and a lot of Freud's theories in this book are just like logical implications um, from his belief of the primary role of the unconscious in sort of dictating thoughts and behaviors. And another thing that was more of an argument from Freud to people of his time, less so nowadays, because we take this idea of unconscious for granted, is that um, back in his time, uh, psychologists kind of thought about disturbing thoughts um, as things that only people with mental illness had, which they called like neuroses, right? Neuroses and psychoses. They, they believe that the disturbing thoughts were kind of only present in those types of people. But Freud, again, is kind of generalizing, and he says that, no, uh, everybody is a little bit nervous. Not nervous in, like, the anxious sense, but, like, nervous in the sense that they have, like, a slight neuroses. And, and the, the processes that are um, occurring very dr dramatically in these people with mental illness are occurring still in regular people, just to a lesser extent. <clears throat> so, yeah, now let's start getting into the actual book uh, that I read. The first one on the compilation, The Psychopathology of Everyday Life, where Freud is um, trying to explain mistakes in speech and uh, everyday sort of actions and uh, forgetting of words, things like that, right? So um, he talks about speech blunders, including the forgetting of proper names, foreign words, um, names in general, the order of words, combining or substituting one word for another, as well as errors in reading or writing or um, chance actions, like sort of like fidgeting or something like that. So uh, in all cases, uh, no matter what the manifestation of the symptom is, uh, an unconscious thought is somehow related to the current expression and is the cause of the error or the, or the forgetting. So usually this is a repressed thought um, that is it's either uncomfortable or painful and the mind wants to avoid uh, dwelling on that subject or being reminded of it. Um, uh, or else the thing is like an inappropriate fantasy or desire, and it's inappropriate to say or do. And thus the, the speaker, when they make the mistake, they sort of uh, betray their true feelings, um, even though they didn't consciously want to. So a good example of what I'm talking about, um, Freud puts on page 82. Um, and like I said, this book's full of examples. I just picked kind of a short one that's easy to understand. So if I can find the page number here, 82. So here's an example. While writing a prescription for a woman who is especially weighed down by the financial burden of the treatment, I was interested to hear her say suddenly, please do not give me big bills because I cannot swallow them. Of course, she meant to say pills. So the idea is that um, she has a, a repressed fantasy, or not, or not necessarily fantasy, but like impulse to tell the doctor like he's charging too much, or like tell the doctor like I can't afford this. But of course it's kind of socially inappropriate to like say that like as you're being treated. So um, instead, this unconscious motive finds a way to express itself that's like more appropriate. Um, and thus the speaker, the woman in this case, betrays her true feelings that the doctor is like overcharging or that she can't afford the treatment. So instead of saying pills, she says bills, right? So <clears throat> uh, you might be thinking that sometimes you make a speech mistake because two similar sounding words are back to back or because you were like anticipating saying one word and then mixed it with the word that you're currently trying to say. Uh, in, other, in other words, you want to evoke like a phonetic cause for your error, um, as opposed to Freud's psychoanalytic mechanism. And Freud actually doesn't deny these kinds of mistakes. So, um, again, you might have simply forgotten someone's name. He's, and the forgetting of the name is not due to like a repressed or unconscious thought. Um, and Freud also doesn't deny this as well. So, uh, in regards to forgetting, 
Uh, I have a quote here I wanted to show on page 40. So Freud says, But I surely shall not venture to assert that all cases of name forgetting belong to the same group. There is no doubt that there are cases of name forgetting that proceed in a much simpler way. We shall represent this state of affairs carefully enough if we assert that besides the simple forgetting of proper names, there is another forgetting which is motivated by repression. So Freud doesn't want to deny like people just simply forgetting something, right? Um, his his theory isn't all encompassing, but he wants to um, account for the times where uh, it's not just a simple case of simple forgetting. So for example, like when you forget somebody's name, but like you know it, but like you, it's on like the tip of your tongue, right? And you just can't say it. Uh, and then when someone says it and reminds you of what it is, you're like, oh yeah, totally, I know what that is. How, how can I forget that? That's kind of one of the scenarios in which Freud is trying to account for with his mechanism. Um, and in regards to other speech errors, Freud says, uh, this is on page 79, he says, Hence, in coarse as well as in finer speech disturbances, which may nevertheless be subsumed as speech blunders, I find that it is not the contact effects of the sound, but the thoughts outside the intended speech, i.e. repressed thoughts, which determine the origin of the speech blunder, and also suffice to explain the newly formed mistakes in speech. I do not doubt the laws whereby the sound produces change, changes upon one another, but they alone are, do not appear to me sufficiently forcible to mar the correct execution of speech. Uh, and then later he says, In a large number of substitutions caused by mistakes in talking, there is an entire absence of such phonetic laws. So, he's saying that, yeah, like, sometimes you make a mistake because you, like, jumble words together. He's not denying that. But he's, he's saying that that's not sufficient to account for all of the, the ways that people mess up in their, in their speaking. There's, there's another mechanism here that people are not looking into. And um, that's sort of what he's trying to uh, explain. So, and he also goes on to talk about how these same sort of repressed thoughts and fantasies can also influence the way people, like, carry out actions. Like, he gives a good example of, like, the forgetting of keys, right? Like, somebody um, has an obligation, they're go supposed to go out and do something, and, but they don't really want to do it because of some repressed thought, and then they can't find their keys all of a sudden when they're supposed to leave, right? This is an idea, same idea, but instead of speaking, it's actions. So, another interesting thing that Freud mentions is that drunk stressed or tired people tend to make these speech mistakes more often and when you call them out on their mistake they'll often give their condition as the excuse right like I, oh I only like messed up my speaking because I was tired or because I'm, I'm a little bit drunk right but Freud actually says that this is not true rather the state is not the cause but the state of tiredness or like um, lack of mental focus actually removes the inhibition of the conscious mind so that the ever-present unconscious mind can assert itself more readily or more apparently uh, so kind of more proof to his theory. Um, another interesting note is that sometimes people deny this unconscious mechanism of uh, repression and fantasy, saying that like, oh, my brain doesn't work that way. And Freud actually addresses this. Um, this is on page 171 to 172. Um, so he says, recently when I had occasion to recite to a colleague of a philosophical turn of mind some examples of name forgetting with their analyses, he hastened to reply. That is all very well, but with me, the forgetting of names proceeds in a different manner. Uh, and in a response to this, he later says, It would therefore be wrong to affirm of all cases um, which resist analysis that they are caused by another psychic mechanism other than here revealed. Assumption, such assumption requires more than negative proofs. Moreover, the readiness to believe in a different explanation of faulty and symptomatic actions, which probably un exists universally in all normal persons, does not prove anything. It is obviously an expression of the same psychic forces which produce the secret, uh, which therefore strives to protect and struggle against its own elucidation. So basically what he's saying is that even though you think or like you deny um, Freud's mechanism working for you, uh, basically that's just another way of your unconscious trying to avoid thinking or being called to the, that repressed thought or fantasy. Uh, it's just another way of you trying to like um, forget about that thing. So. Um, I guess if you, if you want to come to Freud saying that like a specific, specific case of you forgetting or doing something incorrectly, you're going to have to come with a better reason than uh, your theories don't apply to me because he kind of sees that as <laughs> his theory is actually working. So you better come with better reasons than that. Um, so uh, just to recap, um, 
we have Freud coming up with this idea of the unconscious, and not only of the unconscious uh, con constituting a lar large portion of your psychology, but also that um, there are rules and uh, logic by which the unconscious can influence conscious action, and oftentimes this is due to the things like repressed thoughts or repressed um, fantasies that the brain either wants to avoid thinking about or wants to try to express um, in an appropriate way and is trying to find a way to do so. Uh, so a couple of side notes here before we finish. Uh, number one, Freud says something interesting about superstition. So <clears throat> he sort of sees superstition as um, externalizing of disturbing unconscious thoughts. So um, for example, like tripping on a doorstep, right? So if someone who doesn't really know anything about Freud, um, but is kind of superstitious, if they are going out to do something that they're kind of unsure of and they trip on their doorstep on the way out, they might see that as like, oh, that's a bad omen, right? Um, maybe I shouldn't go do this. Uh, whereas Freud sees it as, well, um, the person's unconscious kind of knows that they aren't convicted of going out and doing this thing, and thus they're likely to fail because they're not completing the action with full conviction. And so <clears throat> it's not really like a bad omen, but it's sort of, it's his mechanism at work, right? It's the, the unconscious causing you to trip um, because you, they, it kind of knows that you don't want to go out and do this thing, right? And superstition is kind of as old as humanity is, right? Like, people have been superstitious forever. And so Freud is kind of saying that with superstition, even common people of antiquity have sort of tacitly uh, understood psychoanalytic theory and the, these ideas of unconscious thoughts and motives, even if they don't like understand the direct mechanism that he's proposing. Uh, so se second side note is that uh, eminent uh, philosopher of science Karl Popper, uh, in his book Conjectures and Refutations, he talks about a few systems of thought that he considers to be pseudoscience, and some examples that he gives are Marxism and Freud's psychoanalysis. So, um, uh, I'll give you an example here, I have conjectures and refutations pulled up. Uh, he says, this is Popper speaking, I may illustrate this by two very different examples of human behavior, that of a man who pushes a child into the water with the intention of drowning it, and that of a man who sacrifices his life in an attempt to save the child. Each of these two cases can be explained with equal case in, Freud, in Freudian terms. According to Freud, the first man suffered from repression, while the second man achieved sublimation. So basically, what the, the critique of Popper, um, to Freud is, uh, sorry, Popper is critiquing Freud by basically saying that um, your, your psychoanalytic theory is bad because everything, every sort of phenomena, whether it goes one way or the opposite way, can be interpreted within the framework. So it's not good science, because like no matter what happens, um, you can interpret it within the framework, and it's not falsifiable, right? This is Popper's whole thing, is he wants science to be falsifiable. So, um, whereas the the example of Einstein is different, right? Like when Einstein makes his theory, he makes very specific claims that can be um, uh, refuted with uh, either observations or mathematical calculations, you can refute Einstein. And so Popper thinks Einstein is good science, whereas like Freud is bad because he doesn't really make any claims that are like falsifiable because everything can be interpreted within the framework. And I could go on a whole rant here about like science, pseudoscience, fire band, epistemological anarchism, and how, um, you know, what is good science, but that's not really the point of the video. Um, the reason I bring up Popper is to say that even if something doesn't fit your definition of good science, uh, it can still have human value. And what I mean by human value is that the psychoanalytic theory may still be important because it can help real people with real problems that they have. Um, and indeed, Freud treated thousands of patients uh, using psychoanalysis over his years as a therapist, and he was convinced of, his, of its efficacy um, in helping people deal with psychological issues that they had. So even if you think psych psychoanalysis is pseudoscience, this doesn't mean you can just ignore everything it has to say because, I mean, it had results, right? Uh, and so yeah, that's it. Um, I'm planning on reading some fiction and then diving back into the next work, which is the interpretation of dreams. So yeah, keep your eyes open for another video on Freud because this stuff's super interesting. Um, and yeah, I guess when we get to the third book, that's where it'll really get interesting because that's uh, his uh, three contributions to the theory of sex, and that's sort of where everybody uh, kind of disagrees with him. But I think. Um, his theories are misunderstood, so I guess maybe in a few months we'll get there. Alright, thanks for tuning in. See you next time.